Yeah. We are going live in five, four, three, two, one. We are live now. Is my screen visible? Yeah. Chinmay, start please. Yeah. Chinmay. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. From the we are from a small group of Ayura, which started in the thirteen years back. To now it has become an adolescent group of Ayura. So we are conducting a workshop, an uh, online webinar on crystallopathies. And uh, today, today I welcome all the Ayura members to this uh, meeting. We are having with us Professor Manish Khanna, who is the founder advisor of Ayura. Professor S.L. Chasar, who is also the founder advisor and of Ayura. Professor Rajesh Gupta is with us, who is currently the president of Ayura. Professor Dilip Mojumda sir is there, who is the past president of Ayura. Professor Lokar sir, uh, Santunu Lokar sir, who is also the immediate past president of Ayara. Dr. A. N. Mukherjee, president-elect of Ayara. Dr. Sanjay Keskar, he is the associate editor of the journal of Ayara, that is IJOR. We also have uh, uh, speakers on uh, different aspects of crystallopathies from all over India today. So I will just give a brief introduction. We are having Dr. Kuldeep Malik from Delhi. He will be speaking on etiopathogenesis. Dr. Rameshwar Gupta from Gwalior. He will be speaking on the subject of clinical features of crystallopathies. Professor Manish Khanna, he will be speaking on medical management and newer medicine modalities of treatment of crystallopathies. Professor Rajesh Gupta, the current president of Ayura, he will be speaking on other crystal deposition diseases. And lastly, we have the doyen, Professor Jhasar, S.S. Jhasar from Patna, he will be speaking on Ayura gout guidelines. So, Dear members and viewers, please participate wholeheartedly and please ask questions, ask your queries, whatever these panelists, they will clear it for you. So may I now request uh, our uh, president, Ayura, Professor Rajesh Gupta to give in a few words of appreciation, please. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, most of the things have been covered by you. So I welcome all the speakers and panelists uh, for this uh, webinar too. So this is a series of webinars we are going to organize under the uh, Iora umbrella. Uh, the first was, one was on rheumatoid arthritis and this is the second one on crystal arthropathies. And the third one, uh, we have just decided we will be having it on spondylo arthropathy within a four to six weeks time. So with these few words, I will invite Dr. Kuldeep. Please go ahead, sir, with your first talk. Good evening, everyone. So thank you very much, uh, <coughs> first of all, for inviting me as a speaker here. When I got the topic of crystal arthropathy, and uh, that was just etopathogenesis. So I thought it's just etopathogenesis to start with. But I was not knowing that etopathogenesis starts and the topic is over. But being into etopathogenesis, the book, the, every word has a book. Every word, every word has a chapter in it itself. So just teaching a bare teaching a etiopathogenesis is not easy in these cases, in this crystal arthropathy, because the rest of the speakers also have to speak. So I'll be taking not taking much of the time, but going to the brief that uh, crystal arthropathy, as by the Ben Franklin, be temperated wine in eating, girls and sloth, or the gout will seize you and plague you by the Franklin. There was a history, a small history, is it ex gladiatorial surgeon in the para 
Arena in Asia Minor, who moved to Rome, described gout as a discharge of the four humors of the body in unbalanced amounts of the joints. Earlier, it was taken as a evil that multiple levels causes you this kind of hurt in, in the earlier starts of the era. But it's still there. It's not gone. It was 129-1980, but it's still there that we really don't know what is Krishna Arthropathy till now. We all hear the word uric acid. Bad gaya. The, there is increase in uric acid and we take it as gout. Even before I was preparing this lecture, even I was having the same mind. When I read about it, I got to know that there are a lot of challenges to deal with these situations. I need to cover that. So going on to etiology, I read the numerous papers, publications in all the best of the world, journals of the world, I uh, gave my time and I got, got to know that etiology is still not clearly understood. It's multifactorial. And that factorial part comes from the history, examination of the patient itself. And how it started, when it started, what is the cause of it? Is it just the environmental factors? Is it the dietary factors? These are the metabolic disease all the patient is having innate Im immunity as such. Or is it some kind of septic arthritis, which is a differential diagnosis to diagnose as an etiology. So it's still not understood what are all the factors culminate into one or how. Pathogenesis, we all have studied from day one of our MBBS. is the disorder of purine metabolism, acute, which causes recurrent attacks, it causes arthritis. These are the monosodium urate crystals gain anti into the leukocytes. And how these leukocytes respond to these crystals are still not clear. Phagocytosis of crystals in the joint initially occurs in synovial linings, which causes neutrophil mediated inflammatory response. And this MSU crystals activate caspase 1 and stimulate monocyte and macrophages to produce interleukin 1b. This was the beginning of inflammatory cascade. So, just a small word on epidemiology, we all should know. The 40% are not adequately treated to bring target uric acid below 6 mg per deciliter. Poor treatment adherence is a huge problem. Most labs have a different surroundings or change of the upper limits or lower limits. People still not know what are the uh, people take it at 6, even 6.5, they start the medicine without knowing what are the other factors causing the problem. So, asymptomatic hyperuricemia is always there, more than 6.8. And the target serum urate as per the literature is less than 6. This flow chart is what is about the gout or the pathogenesis or the clinical findings. Everything is there in this chart. And when we start with the conditions of rapid cell turnover, there's hemolysis, other diseases, lymphoid disorders, the usage of medications, inhibitors, cyclosporin, diuretics, causes hyperuricemia. The multiple attacks of hyperuricemia leads to the gout. The dietary part, if you talk about alcohol intake or more of the protein intake, is catabolized into ketones and lactic acid, causing hyperuricemia, which causes ketones and lactic acid compete with Ketones and lactic acid compete with uric acid for excretion in urine, which decreases the excretion of uric acid. So, increased uric acid concentration in blood easily leaks into joints, causing uric acid crystals in a peripheral joint. Repetitive trauma to the first MTP due to weight bearing provides nidus for crystal deposition, which is called first MTP joint involvement. Leading to activation of complement cascade, I have discussed earlier, resident leukocyte chemotaxis, causing neutrophils enter the joint to phagocytize by the crystal and causing this uh, tophaceous gout. So, we need to remember this chart. Going further, I googled up. I asked Google that how, what is the prevalence and risk factors in India? The literature is all of international journal. We, we Indian journal, we don't have our publication to know how many, what, the, what is the prevalence of gout? The, what I got was the answer was from the China. I again typed in India. In India. So, in India, it comes out in 2019, China, India and the USA had the largest number of gout incident cases and according to 0 0.40 million, that is like 29.09%. In India alone, is 24.66% of the gouty cases. Every year, it was increasing. Prevalence is increasing day by day because of multi-factors. Going on to the literature, I searched what are the molecular mechanisms of, of this arthritis. Like patient come with pain. But how this pain starts? We all know purine metabolism. We all know uric acid increase. We, we give the medicine for the hyperuricemia. But what was the etiology? So this literature in 2015 was published by Elsevier and I, uh, by Roman, Romnoda. And I got this answer that in the pain mechanism, the uh, joint is involved, crystals are formed, tissue damage and injured the cells, which release the coupling and cascade, substance P, 
bradykinin PG2 as well as cytokines. This bradykinin PG2 cytokines causes peripheral sensitization, where substance P alone causes central sensitization leading to the pain pathway. Why I'm discussing this etiopathogenesis reason, that will help us for the further diagnosis as well as the treatment path. The treatment of the main function treatment remains on these cases. So the mediators which was released was procyanin E2, cytokines in IL-1B, kinin system from the plasma as well as substance P, which causes the main source and the main mechanism of this. So these main mechanism was taken as a referral future point for our treatment modalities, how the science will succeed. So these are involved development of pain in crystal induced arthritis. Going further, I had one more intention to look for to pathogenesis. How does the calcium crystal deposition disease beyond gout? So it's more than more than a gout that crystal arthropathy is a broad term to diagnose and to treat the patients. So this was been taken. Still, if you read the fourth line, the pathogenic mechanism of calcium crystal deposition is partially understood still. Much remains to be investigated as no drug is available to prevent crystal deposition, permit crystal dissolution or specifically target the pathogen effects that results in the clinical manifestations. Going further, what are the key points? The, we all know that deposition of calcium-containing crystals including the calcium pyrophore CPP and the basic calcium phosphate BCP. The calcium-containing crystals are common but underdiagnosed. CPP crystal deposition disease can be accurately diagnosed using polarized microscopy, we all know, to detect CPP crystals in the synovial fluid, whereas identifying BCP crystals in the synovial fluid is difficult. So, we don't know whether it's gout or pseudo-gout. Still undifferentiated. Uric acid is high. So, we need to go with that. Going further, this is the flowchart showing the acute CCP crystal arthritis as well as calcium periarthritis, which is a part of pseudo-gout. CPP crystals we diagnose on the polarized microscopy, making it CPPD and leading to BCP crystals, which affects a large joint destructive arthropathies like Milwaukee shoulder syndrome and osteoarthritis. Secondly, forms of tumor calcinosis and calciphylaxis too. So these are the methods how to diagnose. I'll not take it further. This part was an RA number paper was there, gout. It was published in 2018, an update of etiology, genetics, comorbidities and management. The, the prevalence of gout is much lower than the prevalence of hyperuricemia for reasons that are not currently clear. Gout is more common in men than women prior to menopause due to the uricosidic effects of the estrogen. That was new to me because of the men, uh, this estrogen. But after menopause, the incidence of gout rises substantially in women. Comorbidities are in, earlier. It's more in male, not in female. But post-menopause, it increases in women also the gout. The comorbidities are an important issue to be dealt with in gout with CVD, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, mitosis, obesity, and chronic kidney diseases. So, etiology, just a second part etiology in this frame. The gout has been added by some in the past, a disease of excess and overindulgence. This view is increasingly being replaced by a more nuanced view. When gout is viewed as a chronic disease of the urate crystal deposition, then its cause can be related back to an imbalance between urate intake or production of and excretion leading to urate accumulation. This creates the environment of inert immune system activation and the resultant acute inflammatory state in clinical manifestations. In one of the paper it was written, the dietary purines and foodstuffs causes this. Purine degradation products causes the cytopathogenesis for this uh, gout as well as hypergout. Intake of alcohol, sweet and bitter. But this paragraph purely shows that even after giving the patients may be able to achieve small reduction in SU with diet alone, but these SU changes have not been shown to lead sustained reduction in the uh, in the gout flares. So it means something again, cascade is still there that just really putting onto the diet, putting onto the alcohol, putting on, but we have to have the multifactorial system to rule out this crystal arthropathy. Is it in genetic, metabolic or other diseases? The ACL ULAR have their own criteria, which will be taken further by the other team. Three steps in combination for the pathogenesis with hyperuricemia are required for MSU deposition, reduced solubility, nucleation, and crystal growth. These factors have been identified to contribute to this process are reduced temperatures, a pH change of 7 to 8, increased sodium ion concentration, connective tissue factors, bovine cart cartilage homogenates. There was one more good abstract was crystal induced arthritis. It was an overview, which is just normal, which we all have in our books. This is surprise that. So, major arthrogenic crystals which I found was monocytium urate causing the hyperuricemia, calcium pyrophosphate dihydrate, hydroxyapatite, and this one. 
Crystal arthritis is gout because of this, pseudo gout caused by the calcium PPD and oxyhepatite crystals. Gout will be taken later by the team. I'll not be talking about this. Drugs will be later on. The, in each of is, is the uric acid balance. The main purpose is the uric acid balance. Is it over formation or decreased excretion mm -hmm. from the urine part? So, we have to need for uric acid balance. The pathophysiology is overproduction versus under excretion, mechanism of urate production, cellular nucleoproteins and nucleotides have 66%, the diet has 33% only. Mechanism of urate excretion is seen by 66% and girt by the 33%. Tissue of uric acid is very important, completely filtered by the glomerulus, completely reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. So, this helps us for the better one. So, this is how the renal handling of the urate happens. There is a pre secretory reabsorption phase. Secretion as a post secretory reabsorption causing the help. This is not my part. I'm just going up because I was not very clear how to diagnose, just to touch etiopathogenesis. This is all together, but every part is different to understand. Hyperosemia alone does not make a diagnosis of gout. Only a subset of people with hyperosemia will develop gout. Probability of gout exists with higher uric acid levels and that were multiple flares, multiple attacks. Asymptomatic hyperosemia generally requires no treatment. This all we know. This will be taken later on. This is the hyperuricemia cascade. Dietary proteins, tissue nucleic acids, androgen proteins and causes urate excretion, overproduction, hyperuricemia, under excretion, hyperuricemia, leading to silent tissue deposition, gout, renal manifestation, as well as cardiovascular diseases. Clinical shape gout will take a later on. The spiral of gout. This is a cascade. Attack starts, crystal form, white blood cells being taken off, crystal pop the cells, cell resistance protein, proteins cause in more white blood cells and cause inflammatory pain and proteins lower pH, make it possible for more crystals to formation. I'll be just going a little further. This is not my topic. Mm -hmm. So just the last slide I want to show. So this is the flowchart I started from. This is a flowchart I got to end because etiopathogenesis is multifactorial. This is only not the environmental factors, only about the metabolic disease. It's all about things. We need to examine the patient. We have to evaluate from the history part. We need to evaluate from all the other formations how it starts. And the speaker will tell us how the treatment has to be measured, taken care of. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Malik. That was a nice presentation. So, uh, can we have a few comments from our our uh, president Rajesh Gupta on this topic? Uh, very that was uh, that was Dr. Kuldeep Malik. He is presently working in ESI Hospital Rohini, Delhi. It's a non-teaching post. But uh, what we have seen by his presentation that it is better than teaching post. Yes, sir. So you have gone through good literature, <laughs> and uh, the, we are glad that you are today. You are the first speaker. So, Professor Rajesh. So, so we all know that's a very complex situation. You know, exact etiology is not very very clear. So everything is on assumptions. You know, as far as etiology is concerned. Purine metabolism, everybody knows, you know, over excretors, under excretors, we all know, you know, these things are okay. But how this, you know, cascade happens, nothing is very clear. This is not only with the gout, with the, you know, other crystal deposition diseases also. Many, Professor Jasser. Right. So, very clearly explained what is clear and what is not very clear. Uh, I think. Uh, you were talking about a condition in the shoulder. So, what you were trying to say uh, about that shoulder condition? Was it Milwaukee disease? Yes, sir. Sir, actually, right. it's a, when we when we examine the patient as an orthopedic part, it is pericapsulitis, periadhesive capsulitis. But sometimes it's a calcific periadhesive capsulitis, which we really are able to diagnose. Okay. I learned from Dr. Professor Manish Khanna, sir, in our earlier lectures. I had done uh, the lectures under him, and he could diagnose that Milwaukee Show syndrome as such is a periodic capsule, it's a pseudo gout. But sometimes we are unable to diagnose that. 
So aspiration of the, the joint at that very moment is very important. We all put in a steroid, we get into the NSAIDs, but we don't look at the bigger picture of it. Right. Patient comes up with pain, pain, pain. That causes a degradation. Mm -hmm. So my point was taken that because mm -hmm. these are the common things we usually see in our daily practice that when the patient comes with shoulder pain, is arthroscopic surgeon will take it as a bankards or rotator cuff tear. The shoulder surgeon will take it as a replacement shoulder with the osteoarthritis. Usually the medicinal people will take it as a uric acid karalo. You will come to know that uric acid is high or not. If a pain is something, they take acids. But diagnosis is still not made. Patient is still in pain. Will grow, patient will get MRI done. MRI will not find anything because this is not the function of MRI to diagnose. So that evaluation should be done according to the patient needs and fancies, but patient needs it. We have to tell the patient MRI is not required at present, maybe in a later run, but right now we should diagnose as from the blood culture, from the blood sample that whether we, the ESR, CRP, there's crystal formation, the polarized microscopy after aspiration, we are getting something or not. Then we go to the radiological part and the joint. X-ray radiology is very important in these cases because in early phases also we can see the even ultrasound, I should say, which is being not done routinely for the shoulder now. It's one of the foremost. This I learned not to just two days before I was looking for the literature for making this pathogenesis that ultrasound shoulder tells us before an MRI will not tell me anything, but ultrasound shoulder is one of the gold standard right now for diagnosing these particles, these parts. Right. So uh, now we are 50 p.m. 20 minutes. Yes. Doctor yes, Chin, sir. sir, you have to stick Thank to you, this. Yes, sir. Also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you part nicely covered up, but uh, commonest side is the great toe. Metatarsophalangeal. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, sir. I'll yes, tell sir. him my next, next one. Next topic. Uh, Ramesh, 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 speak on that. Yeah, can, I, can I say a single word? You have all the rights. You are our future. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Namaskar, sir. Namaskar. Namaskar. One thing I just wanted to say is calcium deposition this really creates hell of a pain. And I actually didn't have so much of exposure and idea about it practically, as we see. But when I was trained in UK, my uh, one of my guide, Dr. Arpit Jari, he used to sir, do an arthroscopic uh, needle manipulation and used to take out that calcium crystal from the rotator cuff. And that used to give relief immediately that I, I could see that surgery over there. But here, uh, I don't see so much of that surgery. So that was the thing I wanted to say. But it's really very painful situation, sir. Okay. Sir, important yes. is Thank important you. how to how to value that part whether the patient should be taken to the that OP is or the not. that is the point. That is the point. Yes. I asked him what is the point and criteria that he said that. A proper and good dynamic ultrasonography yes, will help you to determine whether that is causing any obstruction and you can see it. But I don't know if that sort of musculoskeletal ultrasonography is here. So that is done. We put in the management portion that we'll, we'll cover this and we'll have yeah. in this also, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry uh, to. No, sir. No, sir. Uh, put no, sir. Yeah, Mm. We should have all the input so that we can move. Yeah, again, yes. Mukherjee, nah. yeah. so uh, you, now uh, now we are having our next speaker, Dr. Rameshwar Gupta from Gwalior. Our uh, next speaker is presently, he is the Joint Secretary of IORA, Indian Orthopedic Rheumatology Association. He did his MBBS from GR Medical College, Gwalior in 2003. And thereafter, he joined... He got the fellowship of Iora from RML University under the patronage of Professor Manish Khanna. And he was adjudged the best fellow award for his fellowship. And uh, presently, he is the uh, secretary of Iora. Dr. Rameshwar Gupta is going to speak on your clinical features of crystallopathies. Doctor, thank you, sir. Can I share the screen, sir? 
Is it visible? My screen is visible, sir. Yes, yes, okay. it is visible. So, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, Chenmay, sir, uh, for giving me the opportunity. Uh, so uh, today uh, we'll discuss about the clinical features of gout as the other crystal orthopathy will be discussed by uh, Professor Rajesh Gupta, sir, I think. So the, uh, actually uh, nowadays uh, what I'm uh, seeing in my OPD. Ramesh, last... Ramesh, make it full screen. Hmm. Full screen, Karo. Sir. Sir, sir. Like, sir. Yes. 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 और आगे चलो हां यहां पे मारो मारो क्लिक हां आ गया चल डन यस सर सो सर व्हाट नाउ व्हाट इज वी आर सीइंग इन ओपीडी सिंस लास्ट 4 टू 5 इयर्स द नंबर ऑफ गाउट पेशेंट्स आर इंक्रीजिंग वेरी मच सो वी वी शुड मोर कंसंट्रेट अपॉन द डायग्नोसिस वी शुड कंफर्म अबाउट द डायग्नोसिस एंड नॉट जस्ट अवॉइडिंग द पेशेंट जस्ट सेइंग दैट ऑस्टियोआर्थ्राइटिस और दिस टाइप ऑफ सो द फोर क्लिनिकल फीचर विल कंसंट्रेट ओनली द क्लिनिकल फीचर्स ऑफ फोर क्लिनिकल स्टेज ऑफ आर्टिकुलर गाउट as articulated, uh, the gout is uh, affect, uh, which is uh, affected basically the other system, uh, other system of the body like cardiovascular or renal or soft tissue. But here we are discussing uh, only about the articular joints. So four clinical stages are there: asymptomatic hyperuricemia, second is gout, acute gouty arthritis, uh, third is intercritical gout, and fourth, the last stage is chronic trophaceous gout. In asymptomatic hyperuricemia, usually in majority of the patient with hyperuricemia do not uh, develop uh, any uh, clinical features or uh, for the these joints or renal or, or other. As uh, Kuldeep sir said that uh, uh, up to 8 uh, milligram per deciliter uh, of the uric acid, serum uric acid level, patient may remain asymptomatic throughout uh, their life and only the 10% of the uh, patient uh, is potential to develop the disease with this type of hyperuricemia. Actually, many factors uh, uh, depend uh, for the development of the disease in hyperuricemic cases, like age, if it is more than 40 years, or degree of hyperuricemia. The acute gouty, arth uh, acute gouty arthritis uh, actually, uh, you generally follow the long-standing hyperuricemia and many factors uh, include for uh, the acute attack for the gout hyperuricemic patients. First one is cold. In winter season, uh, it is said that uh, the precipitation of the uric acid uh, uh, is increased. So this precipitation, increased precipitation causes acute attack of gout because of inflammation. Uh, second is the repeated minor minor trauma. It reveals uh, why the uh, great toe and other toes are most uh, poten more potential to develop the disease. Then the fat rich food, non veg especially seafood, alcohol, especially uh, whiskey and wine, uh, sorry, whiskey and uh, uh, that uh, beer, uh, cold drinks. Uh, the study shows that uh, th 300 ml of uh, uh, Pepsi or Coca-Cola can increase 3 milligram per deciliter of uh, your serum uric acid level within 30 minutes. So how these are uh, responsible uh, for uh, the development of disease. Then the surgical stress. Surgical stress, uh, if the patient is feeling pain in the joints, 
fifth after fifth post operative day then you should always think about the uric acid level a trauma dehydration and starvation so some drugs are the other potential cause for due to the development of acute attack. the cardinal features of acute attack are the features of uh, acute inflammation uh, the uh, joint and the surrounding tissues are red hot swollen and due to this acute inflammatory reaction patient uh, may be febrile with shaking chills and the gout uh, uh, may be uh, monoarticular and quasiarticular but very rarely polyarticular especially in the elderly cases and uh, what i um, uh, 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 i have got the experience about this ki uh, monoarticular and quasiarticular are almost equal in my my practice actually what the study said that monoarticular first attack of uh, acute gout usually in the two third of cases as monoarticular and uh, it uh, involve a uh, first metatarsal phalangeal joint in two third of cases but not always uh, in other one third of the cases uh, uh, second most common involved joint is knee then ankle elbow and wrist so we should not uh, only concentrate on that if great toe is not involved that it means uh, this is not gout acute of gout okay, in my practice actually i am seeing that much more cases of acute swelling of knee is presenting nowadays rather great toe then intercritical gout is basically symptom free period between the two attacks of disease and uh, chronic tophaceous gout, uh, it is seen in uncontrolled prolonged hyperuricemia. Uh, tophaceous represents the deposition of urate, uh, urates in soft tissue and the rarely tophaceous, uh, rarely seen in bones and other uh, organs. The size of the tophaceous uh, may be uh, from very small to this type of large one in uh, elbow, uh, what we are seeing here. Uh, tophi it appears as firm nodular swellings on the toes, small joints of the hand, elbows, Achilles tendon, patellar tendon, knees, and other uh, other very uncommon side are pinna. <clears throat> Ulcerated toffee may uh, exude uh, urate and this type of white chalky materials. So we have to go for surgery if this type of patient presents with us. After long-standing disease, patients may develop advanced arthritis and deformity in the, uh, in the affected joints. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh, for a nice presentation. I think uh, because of the constraint of time, we will go for discussions later on. So sure. may I now uh, invite our next speaker <laughs> and the founder and advisor of IRA, Professor Manish Khanna, who is presently the Dean of Academics at the Mayo Clinic of Medical Sciences, Lucknow. Uh, Professor Khanna, please. Yeah. So I'll just uh, share my screen. I think it's visible here. Yeah. Fine. So uh, the topic which is allotted to me is medical management and new modalities. Well, uh, when we say medical management, the management itself is a big topic, including the investigation and the treatment, truly speaking. As we were discussing for gout and hyperuricemia, wonderful explanation and the reasons and the situation have been well commented by the previous speakers. And definitely a reminder would be again to the audience is all the hyperuricemia is not gout. Hyperuricemia simply increases the risk of the gout. Victim sh should be there in mind you are investigating a patient. So where are the needs to manage these hyperuricemic? So before stamping it to a full gout, 
even if it is a hyperuricemia, sometime it may be requiring a treatment. Now, it is very well clear to us that during the acute attack, attack of the gout, many times, rather approximately 63.3% of the patients, they have a normal serum uric acid level. That means if the patient has come to you, you feel it is a gouty arthritis and you go for an investigation. If you are like 60% of the time, you will be having a probability that the uric acid level will be a normal level. So this has to be kept in the mind. It's well, well documented in the literature. The reason for this is because whenever there is an acute attack, truly speaking, the inflammatory factors and the bioactive free glucorticosteroid, they stimulate the excretion, increased excretion of the uric acid at once. And that is the reason because of this increased renal excretion, we found a normal uric acid level at that particular time. So that means the diagnosis is a clinical diagnosis with radiological involvement, with a um, factorial involvement, with a little bit of investigation involvement. This was wonderfully being explained. <clears throat> the process of hypothalamic pituitary adrenal corticosteroid access stimulation because of the pain, because of the inflammation, and as a result, cortisol thrush has been released that have a uricosuric effect and the patient is not having a uh, uric acid level high. That means the patient may be having a normal uric acid level. Now come the question about what we were discussing for the last half an hour. Symptomatic or asymptomatic? See, uric acid is basically a, is not a biologically inert substance. It's not a biologically inert. So whenever it's going to accumulate, it's going to produce its response. And the negative response, as, well, as explained previously also, repeating here, cardiovascular and the renal system. Now, cardiovascular does not going to give a heart attack or, you know, a different type of modality. Simply a cardiac uh, plaques deposition, carotid plaques deposition, especially, which in a long term is harmful. And still, as been mentioned initially, no clear verdict till date for managing asymptomatic hyperuricemia. To add on, what we can like to say is definitely, yes, the level of the uric acid, some literature say it's 7 milligrams, below 7 milligrams you should keep. Some say below 6 milligrams you should keep. I feel always when the level of uric acid rises above 6 milligrams, the patient would be having some symptoms most of the time. But if not, wonderfully well. It's wonderful. But in that case, what? In that case, this gentleman or this woman is going to have a chance increase in chances of gout and the cardiovascular risk. So if you want to have a decrease chances of having a gouty attack, definitely the level should be less than 6 milligram, which may be done by dietary measure, which may be done by medical management. But truly speaking, no pharmaceutical drug is being advised for a asymptomatic hyperuricemia that we are, we know very well. That means when, when, what is the not uh, asymptomatic case? So if a painful foot, if a woman on a diuretic, anti-hypertensive anti by the uh, respected uh, physician is on hydrochlorothiazide, she may come with a hyperuricemia. Now, in this condition, she may produce, she may have a pain. Now, here it has to be taken care of. Similarly, uncontrolled diabetes, we all see 3% of the population in India, diabetic. Most of the time, diabetic are uncontrolled. Why they come to us? Not because of, uh, because of the diabetes, they come with the pain. And in those cases, Hyperuricemia has been seen. Alcohol intake already been explained. Lifestyle disorder, stress. Stress is a very important multifactorial thing which produce indirectly disturbance in the metabolic processes and hyperuricemia have been there. Uncontrolled thyroid disorder. So I always stress to my fellows, TSH examination is the baseline of all the medical management which you try to do in the OPD with the joint pain. Similarly, uncontrolled rheumatoid arthritis. That means a patient of a rheumatoid arthritis, most of the time what we see is if the patient is, everything is controlled, sometime the uric acid was also controlled. Now the patient is coming up with a hyperuricemia. Now, there, now here, the patient is having the pain. This pain is there, but not due to the rheumatoid, due to the hyperuricemia. So again, this is a thing which is, has to be taken in the mind. Similarly, aspirin. So all the geriatrics group, they take aspirin, low dose of uric acid level, uh, low raise in, sorry, uric acid level is there with the aspirin. But practically speaking, we don't see a patient, a geriatric patient on aspirin coming to us or coming to anybody with a hyperuricemia. But practically, yes, if you see aspirin at a high dose, it excretes uric acid. 
but aspirin a low dose it does not uh, it uh, it uh, uh, you know low dose rise the uric acid level but not to that extent but we should remember this thing young patients young adults young males coming sus you are suspecting please please see that they may be having a renal may or may not be having a renal involvement that is what i am trying to say is a secondary hyperuricemia here the renal uh, reasons for a hyperuricemia here. now here again the patient will be having a symptom maybe the gouty arthritis has not been there the crystal deposition has not been there and we all know very well till this crystals are not been demonstrated crystal not been established we are not going to label the terminology of gout now coming to the management part the x ray part so we all know x rays are not very informative but truly speaking, uh, sometime when you are trying to aspirate a joint fluid sample, and luckily maybe the that sample is not having any product for the, the uh, crystal de uh, demonstration, even sometime these X-rays are diagnostic. Now, how they are diagnostic, we're going to just discuss here. Now, you can see here this X-ray where you can see uh, erosive arthritis in the proximal phalanx, and you can see the overhanging edges normal bone density with a, a decreased joint line now normal bone density why we have mentioned it here we are trying to differentiate from other conditions we are not dealing with any other condition so normal bone density with a lesion uh, inflammatory uh, erosive arthritic lesion erosion with overhanging edge is a important uh, landmark so this sponged out bony erosion and the beautiful part is, if you go, to, go for a wonderful digital X-ray, you can find it out. It is a basically a, having a sclerotic margin. You can see here, the margins are basically a little bit of sclerotic. That is a diagnostic feature. Plus, definitely, yes, the X-ray may show uh, the soft tissue shadows of the tophi or intraosseous mass and characteristic feature of the joint er er erosion. Uh, joint, sorry, joint space narrowing. So these are the things which can give clue to many times. As we were discussing previously just now, imaging. So imaging means practically not a radiological imaging, not a CT or not a MRI. Imaging practically means we are trying to find out a ultrasonic examination. Now in ultrasound, many years back, like this is a paper which was published in 2013. So almost we can say till from the last decade, uh, the Western countries are more uh, aggressive in uh, catching out these diseases because of the specific uh, findings which we find in the uh, radiography, the ultrasonic examination, like double contour sign. And these develop much, much earlier than the uh, your X ray findings. So, what is double contour sign? It is simply, you know, this is a head of the metatarsal. So, you can see a little bit of a contour on the head of the metatarsal. It has been mentioned here. So this is a very diagnostic feature which a good ultrasonologist can catch it up. So this was a paper which was being uh, studied and you know it is a comparative study for acute gout with the ultrasound gout, ultrasound examination and dual energy CT finding. Again, it was been proven very well. This ultrasonic examination is the best way out. So what are the other features? Is the double contour sign the only feature? No. See, ultrasonic examination will help you out in a proper fluid aspiration. If you're planning to do it, definitely yes, you can reach the right, right uh, content in the joint, plus double contour sign, plus a sign which is called a starry sky sign. Now, starry, what is starry scar sign? You can see here, small, small crystals, they get collected, giving a form of a star-like appearance. Or this is a clump of a sugar tophi like thing, which is a tophi. So these are the things which in the subclinical stage, we can catch it off. And we can make the diagnosis as was been discussed in previous presentation also we are discussing about the shoulder so uh, these are all not related to specifically to shoulder the knee but definitely yes this is a wonderful tool mri is also a very good tool but mri will only show i'll go back to the last slide mri is more sensitive than the us truly speaking but what for, for what for a later stage when the bony region has already been there but we want to catch up early to give the better treatment so what is the goal of the treatment to terminate uh, rapidly this acute flare, to prevent further attacks. That means uh, definitely you have to take care of metabolic disorders. So if you're targeting to take care of hyperuricemia with a drug like febustate or lipronor, whatever it may be, 
you will not be going to get good give it enough food or good success diet and lifestyle control we all know that colchicine is a wonderful drug for the acute condition acute flare we use it literature says it should be used 0.5 mg thrice daily but sometimes with a bd effect uh, dose it also give a effect in the nasads indomethacin indomethacin was a time when i was a student like 95 99 98 at that time when i did by ms at that time no tetric oxy was been there so we were using indomethacin i still feel a gold line therapy sometime if the patient is not having any jt issue it works wonderfully well but we have to very careful tetric oxy yes with a of course you have to take care of the cardiovascular comorbidity if there are any steroid so uh, long uh, list is there like oral uh, iv is wrong actually intramuscular intraarticular but where the nasads of the colchicine cannot be given where it is an acute condition now the local there is a myth in that way okay, okay go for a fomentation for the acute joint no if you are suspecting it in this the cold ice packs would be wonderfully doing well along with the colchicine and of course if you are giving a steroid so aim is 6 mg i always give 6 mg nevertheless of the which type of the lab report is to be on safer side because patients are patients ultimately at the end of the day they are coming to us with a problem so the choice of the drug is number one thing to decide then preventing the flares with the urate lowering therapy because once you are going to start a urate lowering therapy sometime the flares are there so we need to discuss on that also plus upcoming potential agents now when to start so literature has a varying uh, uh, rotation after first attack after second stack so truly speaking after first stack you may you may not start sometime we have a more slides on this uh, after some time but definitely yes if it is a second attack encourage to go for a treatment and the choices are three static taking out from the urine or lytic so static is allopurinol uricosuric drugs and uricolytic we'll take one by one starting with allopurinol well we all know it's very commonly being drug used and uh, i think for the last 7 8 years till the febixstat has been there in the market little being of uh, downgraded and that is the reason for it that why the febixstat is in the upper hand we'll discuss it so literature says it should be given from up to 900 900 mg but i think we never gone for it so practically 300 mg does a good job require a dose adjustment in a patient of a renal failure some gi side effects and etc there there were 5% so practically no side effects you can say the problem with the allopurinol was even after giving allopurinol the target level of lowering below 6 mg was not been achieved in most of the cases and that is my personal experience also and that is the reason why everybody is just moving switching over to the febsostat most of the time although it's also a non purine selective inhibitor of xanthine oxidase but truly speaking the febuxostat beauty is that it achieves a wonderfully well less than 6 or less than 5 mg of uh, uric acid in a sustainable manner the safety and efficacy is there even if if there is a mild to moderate renal impairment so because uh, the these gouty or hyperuricemia patient at some time uh, down the lane they will be having a renal or they may be having or they might be having so definitely we have to consider that thing in the parameter in the black and white because once a patient with a creatinine of uh, normal creatinine is coming to us we are not sure that this patient is not having a renal involvement so that's another side of a story on the other side of the river febuxostat uh, there was some controversy that febuxostat affects on blood pressure also but truly speaking uh, no such uh, literature still been clearly mention mentioning it that it uh, has an effect on blood pressure so we require more systemic review meta analysis to investigate its efficacy on blood pressure that's a very important thing so coming to the rest of the two that is uricosuric and lytic now uricosuric probenecid the most common uricosuric is probenecid which is been used but the problem is that the tolerability issues are there and because of that it's not very commonly been used and again the renal insufficiency or renal stones again uh, is a is a thing which we need to go for it the problem with the probenecid is one more is in this it has been seen more oftenly that if the patient is on probenecid there is more chances of you know uh, having a attack of gout in during that period of time which discourages the 
clinicians to use for it <clears throat> because very wonderfully well extra uric acid is being removed and there is a this is again a gray area that why it happens that means we are very much clear <clears throat> that these uric acid lowering drug should be avoided in acute gout state but truly speaking many times even if a gout stage has been there if i've given it nothing happens so it's again a gray area with it needed a lot of discussion and discussion on but practically speaking we should be very careful and just try to avoid it now as you remember i've mentioned the chlorothiazide which is a drug which raises the uric acid level so that means now the losartan now losartan is not a drug which you are going to give to a patient in a opd with a hyperuricemia with a gouty attack but truly speaking the patient who is anti hypertensive if they have you have a feature that it is now that is a region for the uh, hyperuricemia then you can request the physician and they also know very well that losartan can be added for the cardiovascular uh, regions for the blood pressure because it's going to have a interfere with the urate absorption so it is a win win situation so losartan is being recommended as anti hypertensive whenever possible and definitely i mentioned it here again it does not mean that the low dose aspirin should be stopped no it has some more benefits now the third is the uricase that is the uricolytic drug now we can excrete it out we can stop the synthesis we can break it up now why the need uh, the need of the breaking it up actually what happened like for example this urolytic drug uricase urate oxidase enzyme it catalyzes the conversion of uric acid to allantoin now what happened that allantoin is far 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 more excretable form than a uric acid so if you are able to convert into allantoin wonderfully well it will be flushing it out like anything but it does not mean that you are going to start and that is why we don't give because it has been recommended that for any severe gout or very uncontrollable gout when the things are out of your hands when there is a failure or any contradiction uh, contraindication to other drugs then these can be used the trade name is respigurase peptigoglase which is available in the market now when to combine the both that is the uricosuric and the static drug so when there is extensive tophaceous gout which are managing it medically surgically whatever way like with a normal renal function then you can combine the both because normal renal function is very important we all know for the uh, uricosuric drugs so probenecid even sulfenpyrazone is being uh, sometimes be recommended or allopurinol and febrexazide can be according added accordingly so that can also be done the ular recommendation again says please go for a level which is less than 6 mil uh, 6 mg per dl because we all know that once the crystals uh, when the level is more than 6 mg the crystal formation occur when the level is below the 6 mg the crystal are start start dissolving sometime in some condition we come across and get tapped in a condition trapped in a condition of a you know acute flare up of a knee joint as dr uh, <clears throat> ramesh was also saying ramesh was also saying so these are the condition in which you feel that it may be a sepsis arthritis septic arthritis yes it may coexist so you you are not very truly 100% blessed that you are not seeing a patient in which the uric acid not been raised that means if even if you are suspecting mm -hmm. any uh, discharge or kid discharge and you are sure and your counts are been raised and you know sepsis may be there so you have to be keep this thing also in the mind while managing this case and this has already been discussed diet but the most important thing i want to point out here is eggs are in low purine so it can be given to the patients can be taken to the individual out of the way yes hereditary involvement is been there to very less, less extent but still been there many times the patients don't have any history and they have a hyperuricemia history in their families uh one should remember that when you are when you are taking a red meat 40% risk of the gout has been there when you are taking more seafood because if you would have wonderfully more purine levels so 50% risk of gout has been there dairy products as typical myth that uh, gout hai uric acid hai to doodh dahi nahi khana it's not like that actually dairy products basically there is by the dairy products with the curd with the milk there is a increased uric acid excretion so it is a blessing you know and at the same time low purine also some literature even say that coffee is a wonderful uricosuric that is while taking a co coffee you can have a increased uric acid excretion 
which is not there with the T. But uh, uh, truly speaking, we don't have so much literature into it. So caffeine is considered to have a methyl xanthine, which is thought to be a xanthine of this inhibitor. So a purine breakdown is decreased. So coffee drinkers can have a benefit, but still it needs a lot of study further to go for it. But definitely, yes, the mushrooms, the green peas, the spinach, broccoli, cauliflower, which have a high level of purine should be avoided, but not the dairy product, not the egg, truly speaking. And the sweetened soft drink has been mentioned earlier because all the sweetened things are having a lot of fructose and glucose. Now, the, not only this, the fruits which are having a lot of fructose, they produce increase in our uric acid level. That means, okay, that means we are not able to eat fruit. No, no, not like that. See, apples are a storehouse of a natural fructose. We all know. Eating a lot of apple will definitely produce a apple a day, keep a doctor away is fine. But eating of 10 apple a day is a problem. So that may again worsen the gout situation. So that we have to keep it in mind. Grapefruit, oranges, pineapple, strawberries, they are high in vitamin C, but low in fructose. So they are good. <clears throat> so this we have to keep in mind <clears throat> while managing such patient. <clears throat> As been mentioned, alcohol, yes, but truly speaking, on a lighter note, beer is more having a risk than a liquor, than a alcohol. Wine, the literature says that wine don't have an incidence in the gout. So that does not mean that by the evening you start eating, having a lot of wine. But yes, wine in a uric acid patient is fine. Alcohol, that is a liquor, big no. Beer is a big, big, big no. That will produce an immediate next morning symptoms. And the self-care like drinking water, which is required, weight reduction, so I'll not revise some few points, but just giving some few recommendations uh, uh, for the American College of Rheumatology. The two more important things, again, repeating the same thing, asymptomatic hyperuricemia with no gouty history, no tophi, nothing to be given, just a warning. Patient with the first attack, flare, no need to start a uric acid, just you can wait provided the patient is not having any renal involvement, but if there's associated CKD of a more than three uh, or the uric acid is very high, suppose more than nine, you know, in that case, it needs an intervention. As far as the newer kids are considered in the drug block, so we have, uh, I'll, I'll just go for the reason for the newer kids actually. As already been mentioned, attack of gout, inflammatory response due to the monosodium crystals, uh, rather immediated uh, immune system response and pro-inflammatory cytokines have been released, excessive amount, which are which we are trying to control it with the NISAD, with the toricoxib, with the endomethacin, with the steroid, but they're not getting into control. Now here, these we can tackle I IL-1B or TNF-alpha and beta with some biological. Anakindra is a drug, which we all know, <clears throat> 100 milligram daily, it can be administered subcutaneously till the flare is resolved. And it is a preferred interleukin-1 antagonist for the use in the gout flare-up because of its short half-life. That is the best part, but still not been approved by FDA and we don't use it practically. But to cover it, yes. Similarly, canacunumab has been approved in the, by the European Union and United States uh, of America for the treatment of patients who have at least three gout flare-up annually, which cannot be managed with other treatment options. So again, this can be used. And TNF antagonists like etanercept can also relieve the acute inflammatory response and can therefore use if nothing works. <clears throat> but truly speaking, friends, everything works. This is the last slide, 2006 ULA recommendation. They say that, look, if you're having acute gout patient, definitely you have to walk it up out of the screening com comorbidities and current medications, whatever it may be, the things. If there is no renal issues, then definitely you can go for colchicine, NISAD, prednisolone, intraarticular injection, whatever feel like, oh, in the which we have discussed. But if the renal involvement has been there, then definitely to avoid colchicin and NSADs. And to go away, if gradually, even after giving the NSAD, nothing is working, then definitely interleukin 1 blockers can be worked up. And so bottom line would be, the goal of early management can only be achieved with early patient presentation, with our early knowledge and proper knowledge, with uh, with but actually what happens some inaccuracies are there in diagnosis the lack of management guidelines are there incomplete patient education is there and then the things are really very challenging which need to be addressed very 
rapidly and very promptly. Thank you for a very patient hearing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Khanna. So we are already over the time. So may I now request our next speaker, Professor Rajesh Gupta. He is a professor in HOD of uh, Orthopedic Jammu Medical College. And he is the present president of Indian Orthopedic Rheumatology Association. He will be speaking on other crystal deposition diseases. Professor Gupta, please. Yeah. So a few things have already been covered by you know, uh, earlier speakers. So I will be covering uh, three conditions uh, uh, in these you know, other crystal deposition diseases. The first one is calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease. So there's a deposition of calcium pyrophosphate dihydrate crystals within the articular hyaline cartilage. The acute manifestation of this condition is known as a pseudogout. It is common in the elderly and female to male ratio is 2.7 to 1. Now, there are many risk factors for the CPPD. Apart from aging, there are many disease associations, including primary hyperthyroidism, hemochromatosis, hemosidrosis, hypophosphatasia, hypomagnesemia, hypothyroidism, chronic gout, post menisectomy, and gentleman's uh, disease. Now, gentleman disease, you know, this is autosomal uh, recessive uh, disease. There is a salt tibulopathy and the patient may have hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia. And apart from this, there are epiphyseal diseases. Now, coming to pathophysiology, again, the reason is not known. 70% of the patient may have pre-existing giant disease. There may be biochemical changes in aging or there are diseased cartilage due to many conditions. Now, probably there is increased production of inorganic pyrophosphate and a decreased level of the pyrophosphate disease. So it is thought that it is due to the mutation in the A and KH gene. So there is enhanced activity of the ATP pyrophosphohydrolase and 5-nucleotidase, which catalyzes the reaction of ATP to adenosine and pyrophosphate. So increased elaboration and extracellular transport of the pyrophosphate. So pyrophosphate combined with the calcium to form the CPP crystals. Now there is a release of CPP crystal in the giant. They are phagocytosed by the monocyte macrophage and neutrophils. So there is a release of chemotactic and inflammatory substances and all this will lead to the inflammatory cascade. So clinical manifestations, it can be asymptomatic, but the commonest manifestation is the acute, which is also known as the pseudogout. The patient may present with the pain and swelling of the giant with the increased temperature and tenderness. So there can be subacute and chronic manifestations. So giant involved most commonly is the knee, followed by wrist, shoulder, ankle, elbow, hands, and the temporomandibular giant. It is polyarticular in two thirds of the cases. And in 50% of the cases, there can be low-grade fever. The other clinical manifestations, there may be association with our enhancement of the osteoarthritis, induction of severe destruct destructive disease, which radiographically mimic neuropathic giant. The production of the chronic symmetric synovitis may resemble rheumatoid arthritis. Intervertebral disc and ligament calcification may lead to spinal stenosis or there may be periarticular tophus like nodules. Coming to investigation, the synovial fluid analysis is important. There may be rhomboid or rod like crystals which are weakly positively birefringent or non birefringent with polarizing light. Increased leukocyte count, but it is less than 2000. X rays may show punctate or linear radio dense. Deposits within the fibrocartilaginous giant menisci or articular hyaline cartilage, which is also known as chondrocalcinosis, and patient can give can have osteoarthritic changes within the giant. Coming to the treatment part, sometimes it is considered self-limiting, self but most of the patients will require few days or week of uh, weeks of bed rest and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. But if they don't respond, few of them may require giant aspiration and one or two shots of intraarticular glucocorticoid injections. Colchicine may be indicated in low doses in patients with the recurrent attacks. 
short course of oral glucocytes are interleukin uh, 1 beta antagonist anakinra may be indicated in severe polyarticular attacks hckos are methotrexate for persist persistent synovitis and joint replacement may be needed in destructive large joint arthropathy now coming to the second condition which is a calcium appetite deposition disease so there is a abnormal accumulation of the basic calcium phosphate that is bcp in the soft tissues now basically this is a trio of carbon carbon carbonate sub substituted uh, uh, that uh, hydroxy appetite tri calcium phosphate and octa calcium phosphate now this basic uh, calcium phosphate you know it is it resembles the calcium phosphate crystals which is a normal component of you know bones and the teeth but in pathological conditions uh, it may induce intense you know inflammatory condition in the tissues it may disturb the biomechanics of the normal tissues and when interact with the surrounding uh, cells it may lead to the uh, the release of the interleukins and the cytokines so its deposition in areas of tissue damage is known as dystrophic calcification and in hypercalcemic or hyperparathyroid states its deposition is known as metastatic calcification it may also deposit in certain conditions of unknown mm -hmm. cause so apatite crystals are deposited primarily on the matrix vessels so normally the inhibitors of mineralization such as pyrophosphate and proteoglycan they inhibit the calcification of the soft tissues but when these protective mechanisms they break down the abnormal calcification occurs in most situations the calcification is no no consequence but when the crystals are released an inflammatory reaction occurs so it can again be asymptomatic but uh, most of them are having acute reversible inflammation they can present a chronic damage to the joints capsules tendons bursa in around the knees shoulders hips and the fingers leading to acute synovitis bursitis and tendinitis these three conditions they are also known as you know the calcific tendinitis periarthritis and the the bcp arthritis may lead to chronic destructive arthropathy there are many conditions which are associated with this disease again starting with aging osteoarthritis milwaukee shoulder destructive arthropathy tendinitis bursitis tumor calcinosis hyperparathyroidism renal failure connective tissue diseases heterotrophic calcification and fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva so we have already discussed about this condition milwaukee shoulder syndrome it is a rare one it is more common in females there is extensive deposition of bcp crystal in the large joints with gradual onset of pain which may progress to the severe pain and joint destruction and disability so diagnosis again synovial fluid or tissue analysis under electron microscope they look very small crystals there may be clumps of shiny crystals intra or extra articular non bifringent leukocyte count is again less than 200 2000 predominantly neutrophils the globules are aggregates they stain purplish with the right stain and bright red with the alzerin stain alzerin red x rays will show intra or periarticular calcification without without erosive destruction or hypertrophic changes uh, this is a calcification we see in the supraspinatus tendon and this is the calcification in the soft tissue around the elbow joints but ultrasound is also very very important investigation to rule out these conditions we have already discussed that the treatment is again non specific for arthritis or periarthritis the acute attacks of bursitis and sino synovitis they are sometimes self limiting but patients usually required non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs or oral colchicine for at least 2 weeks intra or periarticular glucocorticoid injections are needed in some patients now third condition is calcium oxalate deposition disease also known as cox disease now calcium oxalate is basically an organic component which can be acquired exogenously through the diet or it can be endogenously produced via the metabolism in the body so the increased levels there is a pathogenesis one is primary oxalosis it is a rare hereditary metabolic disorder there is enhanced production of the oxalic acid 
there is a hyperoxaluremia and deposition of calcium oxalate crystals in the tissues leading to nephrocalcinosis and the renal failure now the secondary oxalosis two reasons one is chronic renal patients on dialysis if we give ascorbic acid supplements to these patients they are metabolized to the oxalate and they are inadequately cleared in the uremia and dialysis now second uh, the thing is when there is a gastrointestinal you know fat um, malabsorb malabsorption things the this you know uh, the oxalic acid it gets uh, absorbed in the increased quantity in the uh, system from the gut so it leads to increased uh, amount in the blood leading to deposits in the visceral organs blood vessels bones cartilage synovium and the peri periarticular tissues now clinical manifestations the fingers wrist elbow knees ankles and feet are involved leading to acute synovitis and there may be progressive articular destruction again the synovial fluid anal analysis non inflammatory or mildly inflammatory with leukocyte count less than 2000 crystals they are variably shaped and variable by refringence to the polarized light but most commonly we see bipyramidal with strong bifringence and stain with alizarin red s so these are the bipyramidal crystals we see in this condition x ray again may show chondrocalcinosis or the soft tissue calcification now treatment is supportive uh, you know uh, we need to give non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs colchicine and the intra articular <laughs> glucocorticoids but decrease the level of the you know oxalic acid or oxalates in the body we need to give patient the increased quantity of water more than 3 liter per day and then we need to give some urinary crystal inhibitors then we need to give diet low in you know uh, oxalic oxalates and low in fat we need to give some calcium supplements there is another uh, drug no uh, there is a drug also by the name of lenithium carbonate can, which can be given 1 g you know three times a day basically this 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 combines with the oxalates in the gut and increases its excretion with the stools normally this is excreted in the urine so this is all from my side thank you very much these three conditions i have covered yes, thank you thank you thank you thank you uh, thank you professor gupta for your nice presentation so now we are coming to the last presentation after going through the etiopathogenesis clinical features then management different modalities of treatment and other crystal deposition disease so may i now request professor ss s jhasar from patna to talk about the ayura gout guidelines professor jhasar he is thank you chairman professor chinmay and uh, our respected president ayura dear colleague professor manish khanna and non agile dr dilip and all the young colleagues including dr rameshwar who all are here friends i don't have to say many things but only i have to prioritize the guidelines which should form our basis i would again like to repeat that one key principle in gout management is that you should consider lowering the serum urate concentration below its saturation point and you can prevent new crystal formation so you dissolve the ex existing crystals and do not allow new crystals to form so what we say for rheumatology that it is a disease which cannot get cured can only get controlled this is one which can get cured too now i would like to put a question name a disease where an informed patient can reach the same decision as their clinician regarding its treatment 
And the answer is number one. It could be many, but gout is definitely one. So the first guideline that we should follow is that not only treat your patient, educate your patient so that whenever an acute emergency arises, the patient is aware, like his doctor, which particular drug the patient has to take. So this is guideline one. Now, friends, talking about our own IORA guidelines, we should be conversant about various guidelines in the world. And one which we being close to rheumatology are following is ULAR 2016 guideline regarding which Dr. Manis and all other colleagues have talked about. But after 2016, British Society of Rheumatology and American College of Physicians, they came out with their clinical practice guidelines in 2017. The French Society of Rheumatology came in 2020 and also American College of Rheumatology in 2020. But NICE, which is so familiar to each one of us, is National Institute for Health and Care Excellence is the latest, and this is 2022. So I will be talking about our IORA guidelines, taking lessons from them. So the, the American College of Physicians, they say that treat to avoid symptoms, and this is their approach to urate-lowering therapy. But we have great disagreement with this recommendation and we would like to follow treat to target strategy. So our guideline two is adopt treat to target in which titration of urate lowering therapy dose is used to achieve the target serum urate levels. This target has already been talked about. Now, now, what the NICE guideline in 2022 says, that it is in agreement with ACR, BSR, and ULAR guidelines in recommending treat to target, as I have already told you. But this treat to target is good for patients who do not have history of major cardiovascular disease. Now, our first line of therapy, urate lowering therapy, will be in accordance to the NICE guideline, which said it could be either allopurinol or febuxostat. No preferences, but of course, all of us are aware when we there is some renal problem, febuxostat could be the first. But other guidelines have said that febuxostat can only be the second line. So NICE guidelines have concluded that no difference exists in cost effectiveness or clinical efficacy between febuxostat and allopurinol. Target level of serum urate, NICE says up to six milligram, which is equivalent to 360 mu mol. But British Society of Rheumatology recommends 5 milligram. Now let us see what we want to say in our guideline 4. It revolves around the goal serum urate should be lowered and maintained at target serum uric acid. And we follow the ULAR 2016, which says for a high, um, for a disease of gout, which has higher level of evidence, it should be less than six. But in severe gout, including those with TOFI or frequent attacks, it should be five. Guideline number five talks about regular follow-up or no regular follow-up. So we have kept for ourselves three to six monthly follow-up guided by clinical presentation up to two years, and if there are no acute flares, then go for yearly one. What NICE says that follow up and monitor the disease 
only annually after the target has been achieved. No other uh, guideline have mentioned about the follow-up, but I'm sure the ULAR guidelines also mentions it should be a regular follow-up. So patient serum urate level, even after achieving the target level, must be uh, looked into, but it is not followed in other guidelines. Drugs, most of them have been talked about by Professor Manish Khanna, and they are traditional therapies, alupirinol. They have, there are newer additions, febuxostat, peglutikase, lecinonar, topiroxostat, and the other biologics narrated. Now, the use of uricocerix, there are limitations in NICE 2022. NICE 2022 says, that limit your management to only xanthine oxi oxidase inhibitors and they have not considered urocosuric drugs. So, ineffective in patients, intolerant of or do not respond to febuxostat and allopurinol. What we will do? So, in such patients who have not responded to either Febuxostat or allopurinol, our guideline 6 says that treat these patients with uricosurix if not responding well to xanthine oxidase inhibitor, but do not use them alone. Combine them with xanthine oxidase inhibitor and probenacid and lecinunar, Professor Manis has already told you about their limitation. Guideline number 7 says if there is acute gout flare the clean, as per clinical diagnosis, and also it has been enumerated by the first speaker that the fasting serum uric acid level usually is normal during the acute gouty attacks. So the drugs that you should take recourse to are NSAIDs, consistent with its limitation in lower doses, and steroids plus or minus on short-term basis. Well, guideline number eight, uric acid dissolving drugs for tophi and stones can be used intravenously, and this is peglotic pe case. Cristexa is the trade name, but in fact, Unfortunately, none of our Indian patients can afford it. You will be surprised to know the routine price. It is 30,000 US dollars for one injection. And this one ML, which has eight milligram, has to be repeated every two weeks. But it is in fact for a world, like I was there in ULAR two years earlier, and there, there was a presentation from New Zealand, and they said this is the only drug, drug that they are using because insurance may, makes all the payment. But there has to be certain warnings and precautions, history of heart disease, blood pressure, allergy, pregnancy, lactation, don't use it. And whenever you are using it, monitor uric acid level more regularly, and it could produce side effects like high blood pressure, too high or too low lipid levels in the bloodstream, kidney disease, diabetes, abnormal heart rhythm, and heart failure. Friends, this is our guideline number nine, already enumerated by various speakers, including Manis, that this is one standard investigation that we must ask for. Dual energy CT scan of the foot affected by tophaceous gout, demonstrating collection of NSU crystals in the red. And you will be surprised to know, or maybe you are aware, that many patients of rheumatoid arthritis in which this CT scan has been undertaken, they, are, they have shown majority of the cases these gouty deposits. And the second, again, Dr. Manis has told you, the double track sign in the articular cartilage, particularly in the knee, but it could be in any other place. So no, this is guideline number nine, no diagnosis of 
gout is complete without these two. Of course, the polarized light microscopy and you can look in, into the crystals here. So this is the crystal and this is the scale of 100 mu which can measure it. Friends, uh, I would only like to point out that though there are not many cases, a rheumatoid patient can have a coexisting gout or vice versa. Obesity must draw your attention to this also. I will not go into the details. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will stop share. Thank right. you, sir. Thank you very much for a wonderful and elaborate presentation covering all the topics. So then now uh, we are already past the time, but we can have a discussion among the panelists. Yeah. So we are having uh, Sanjay Keskar has also joined. So uh, any any points uh, you want to clarify, members? Yeah, Professor can Rajesh I, Gupta. Can I start with the things here? Yeah. So I think very, very practical points I'm going to, you know, uh, regarding the treatment uh, part. Dr. Manish and Professor Jasar, I have already discussed with Professor Jha many, many times. So for the audience, you know. So sir, uh, uh, Professor uh, Manish, so uh, for how long should we give the these, you know, in acute flare, these anti-inflammatory drugs all colchicine? So definitely in acute flare, uh, you have to give it till your serum uric acid level is being settled down to a remarkable extent. Now, the question is, uh, uh, there's no thumb rule as such which we follow, but definitely colchicine is a drug which is only a temporary measure to kill uh, the inflammation process to have a stop in the vicious cycle. Ultimately, we require, as we, we have discussed, zircosuric drugs. And uh, truly speaking, uh, if we are not dealing with any cause, that means if this patient is not a diabetic patient, not a patient with some drug, not a patient with you know, you know we, where the cause has not been there, it's idiopathic, not a reason of having any gout without any diet control. There, the prognosis is not very good because here, in that case, we need to monitor the uric acid throughout the life with by which by the diet control with the lifestyle modification, they are able to maintain below five or below six, whatever it may be, without any symptoms. If yes, it's fine. Then the medicine can be stopped. Otherwise, in a in a divided dose form like I always taper the dose, not, uh, not uh, you know, like for example, if I'm giving 40 milligram Febixostat, so I maintain the patient to twice a week of Febixostat, 40 milligram. For no, no, sir, Dr. Manish, I, I'll interrupt. No, we are only discussing the, these, you know, uh, for acute flare, we are discussing only non steroidal steroids or the colchicine. For how long that do we give that? that? That will be next question. So that, that is to be given only till uh, that acute flare is off. It, uh, it may be three days, four days, one week. Whatever it may be. Whatever it may be. So as you soon as the... Two with, with, a, with, a, with a, sir, with, to interrupt, with the steroid, the uh, acute flare is very rapidly being uh, responded within two, three days of a time. And here we can taper it down, the pulse therapy. With the colchicine, uh, it takes a little longer to taper it down. So at least for a week time. Professor Jha wants to say something, sir. All right. I simply wanted to tell you that this also is a fact that colchicine is not very frequently used in spite of the fact that it's a wonderful drug as far as acute flares are concerned. So classically, the teaching was use it till the time and keep on increasing the dose till the time there is diarrhea. But it has toxic effects and in my experience, I have lost one or two patients while using it in my earlier career. So whenever we use it, we do not want to reach that level where it will cause diarrhea. Keep it limited. And as Dr. Manis has very rightly said, with the use of steroids, glucocorticoids, uh, many a times you do not require them. Okay. Uh, Dr. Kuldeep, you want to say something? Uh, Rajesh, can I say, say something? Rajesh? Yes, sir. Uh, in, generally, in my practice, it is for 10 days. Uh, 10 days, then I shift to the um, uric or so uric uh, drug. 
that is actually in sir uh, it is very subjective you know some patient may respond within 3 days some may not respond in 4 to 6 weeks even of anti inflammatory yeah that's true so this that's is true. very this is very subjective patient yeah. to patient so and can i say by the way two words just now that i think uh, the time duration uh, has been may, uh, missed but in my practice and in some of our we have discussed in our indian uh, physicians practice we could see more of attack of gouts in this period of October and November. What the panelists think about this one? And what about the soft tissue gout? Because a lot of low back pain patients are soft tissue gout. And you sir, 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 we will discuss about this later. Let, let's go one way. Next sir, year, we are, we are discussing just acute flare. That the... Yes, yes, endometastin in the uh, acute flare. Okay, what okay, is fine. the opinion uh, opinion of the house about endometastin? That that comes under non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, one okay. thing I will also like to add, Professor Rajesh, Sir. that I was recently in a rheumatology conference and the topic under discussion was osteoarthritis, pure osteoarthritis. And there the expert panel consisting of rheumatologists, they opined that even in cases of osteoarthritis, if you use in a very low dose, maybe 0.5 uh, uh, twice daily of is, is effective. Colchicin, sir? So, no, no. Uh, yes. Colchicin. Right. Yeah, colchicin. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Dr. Kuldeep, you want to say? Sir, actually, I was uh, when I was looking at the slides of Dr. Professor Jha, sir. Sir, you have in one slide there was that uh, usage of NSAIDs even with colchicin and low dose and steroids. But sometimes as we as we see the patient, we give an acute flare colchicin and uh, I have started giving, but uh, that it, we have to stop till the time of diarrhea. But what is the effect of steroid? You think steroid at what that time when you give an early flare, the patient has uh, diarrhea. Should we stop steroid or should we continue steroid? No, no, no. What I have said is there are three options available with you. Not that you start using all the three at the same time. Suppose you don't want to use colchicin. You are afraid of using it. And I have said, do not go to the extent of producing a diarrhea. So limit your dose that it controls and take recourse to steroid, simultaneous steroid. So that's why it is within 48 hours that the patient... Sir, I think the initial, initial uh, the teaching was 0 0.5 milligram half an hourly for 10 to 12 doses. Or right. till the diarrhea yeah, develops. Is, that yeah. that is what we were right. taught, you know. I think now we are using 0.5 or 0.6 milligram VD or TID. It may not cause that much of diarrhea. Am I right, right, sir? Yes, absolutely correct. Truly speaking, yeah. my clinical yeah. practice, I never prefer to give colchicin. I always prefer to give a pulse therapy or steroid to get rid of that situation and then depend on the urocosteric drug because I don't want to waste so much time in waiting for the you know doses to be increased in that way and that is not my requirement that is the requirement of the patient so and as you, mentioned you, yeah sorry uh, yeah. you may have to evaluate your renal function status as well definitely. before you start the treatment yeah. definitely. Definitely. so sir the second question with this is after think, the acute attack i think i think professor going... i think yeah. professor keskar wants to add something uh, that, keskar sir uh, yes, good please. evening good evening yeah, yeah, sir yeah. please please I... please uh, good evening, sir. I do agree with Manish Khanna, sir. Very rarely nowadays we use colchicine. Uh, most of the most of the time in my practice, in acute even in acute flare, uh, uh, I use generally this paracetamol and and endomethacin that takes care. And what is more important in education? What uh, Manish Khanna, sir, and Professor Jha told that education is very very important if you teach the, your patient properly, they will, uh, because most of the time, you know, it is because of this uh, uh, aggravating factors. They are creating problems. For example, if some minor trauma is there, sometimes uh, sometimes if minor trauma is there in the evening, you will be getting that kind of pain. And if you take paracetamol it takes care. So these are the things. Very rarely I come across the severe kind of uh, 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 gouty arthritis which needs colchicine or uh, uh, other medication. So that is my opinion. Second comment, sir, I want to uh, say about the age Manish Khanna, sir, said that this curd is not at all creating problems. So, sir, in my 
practice, I have come to the conclusion that there are three factors as far as diet is concerned. One is cold things. If you if you take whatever things you are taking, say for example, in even in alcohol, why beer is causing more problem? Because people are taking beer very cold, very chill. And uh, uh, similarly, the dairy product, the curd is not the problem. The product is not the problem. But most of the time, जो खट्टी दही होती है जो कर्ड लाइक मटेरियल या हम कहेंगे ना कि अगर आप खट्टी दही खाएंगे तो जरूर प्रॉब्लम होगी सेकेंडली जो दही को अगर वो लोग ठंडी ठंडी खाएंगे तो प्रॉब्लम होगी सो द कोल्ड इज द प्रॉब्लम द चिल थिंग्स आर द प्रॉब्लम एंड थर्ड थिंग इज द रॉ लाइक मटेरियल लाइक हम जो सलाड खाते हैं पर्टिकुलरली इफ यू टेक द टोमेटो सलाड टोमेटो रॉ मटेरियल देन ऑल्सो इट क्रिएट प्रॉब्लम सो इन माई प्रैक्टिस आई हैव कम टू द कंक्लूजन इफ यू टेक द चिली थिंग्स इफ यू टेक द रॉ मटेरियल एंड यू If if people are taking curd like material, जिसमें हम लोग खटाई वाली चीजें बोलते हैं तीन चीज अगर वो खाएगा तो अगर उसको कोई एग्रावेटिंग फैक्टर ऑलरेडी है पेशेंट को तो जरूर उसको एक्टिव प्लेयर होगी उस दिन दैट इज दैट इज माई ओपिनियन very true sir that is more important especially seen with the history of the patient with rheumatoid arthritis many time simply by the taking history of these specific thing we come come to the conclusion of the attack now this attack which you are saying is the attack of the pain of the joint now it is right, sir, the right. rheumatoid it is due to the serio negative arthritis it is due to the hyperuricemia it is due maybe due to the cold which is the thing in which the crystals get precipitated that is a very uh, broad basically but definitely yes these are the things to be taken care of yes sir jha sir no i just wanted to say that uh, giving due importance to the question raised by professor rajesh he wants to get us reeducated on the use of colchicin that this is a drug which is not to be thrown in the dustbin it is a good drug it has been used in very excessive dose please let us start using it but within brackets in safe dose it is really effective so uh, mani sir second question is when to start xanthine oxidase in oxidase inhibitors as we mentioned in acute attack we definitely want don't want to get the things more uh, brighten up so as soon as this acute attack is been settled down with a steroid which we do it very fastly from my side so i i, I don't uh, wait for a week time just uh, the uric acid level if because most of the time in those cases the uric acid level is normal so as soon as the clinical improvement is been there and uh, in that case we'll again go for an investigation within two three days of time to see what is the uric acid status if it is coming to be a higher side then i prefer this as uh, anthine oxide in beta if it is still not been coming to the higher side maybe it's a extra wash of the kidney removing all that attack then definitely i'm not going to start the uricosuric drug and if yes if it is a chronic type of a gout if the patient is on hyperuricemia with all the symptoms then yes as been mentioned by jhasar also aloperinol is a wonderful drug and febuxostat but we we mainly go for febuxostat because it's more fast acting in uh, what i seen in my clinical practice attaining the uh, level of 6 below the 6 mg of uh, hyperuricemia so that is the choice of the drug so uh, so sir in acute attack suppose it settles in 3 days and should we get the uh, uric acid level again and then start the drug if the acute attack is having a normal uric acid level only in that case but if this acute attack is having a hyperuricemia 8 mg 9 mg then there is no need to repeat you have to just wait and to start the uh, uricosuric drug it may be 3 days 10 days and anything you know till the, the acute attack subsides you start with the ur uricosuric drugs truly speaking and that is why uh, as been mentioned by everyone here we should start using colchicine but if a patient if my i am having a pain in my knee i'll not fit for the call colchicine for my family members go for a very rapid strong uh, 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 cutting of the vicious circle by steroid and then shifting over to uricosuric drugs dr ja sir ja yeah, sir right i just wanted to say that the earlier view used to be that do not use the uric uh, uricosuric agents during the acute attack itself lower it down when it settles down clinically so we say it is a drug not of war it is a peace time drug and this peace time is achieved maybe invariably after 2 weeks but 
of late there has been change in uh, taking position and now people say there is no harm even if you as dr manish has said you start it earlier uh, but i think we old guards will always like wait for 10 days or 15 days acute symptoms have subsided and then go for it so i suppose that your symptoms have subsided should we continue with the anti inflammatory for a few more days along with the, these the drugs synthinoxidase inhibitors it I can be, it can it's, be my it's, harm. it's can not be necessary to continue with nsaids if you are means you will be overloading the patient Should i think sir uh, manish ji kuch Truly speaking, yes, uh, definitely you need to taper on NSAIDs, but every case is a different case. And depending upon the severity, we should remove NSAIDs so that at least we should know where we are standing, where the patient pain is standing, where the patient knee pain is standing. Only then, yes, but definitely it has been seen, sir, that as soon as this acute stats subside, the dose decreased, we decrease the taper dose, whatever the endometrial oxide, whatever it may be. And within 10, 15 days of time, as the uric acid also subside, uh, settle down, symptoms improve. Even if it is not a chronic gout, because in the chronic gout, there will be degeneration, there will be erosion. That's altogether different. You have yes, to sir, give, uh... give the option to the patient as well. Because many a times what happens, his father also had it. So he knows it is coming to him. So he is aware of everything. So... Again, educating the patient here becomes important. And especially that if the father is having, that means we are not going to cure the disease. You have to work it up in a different manner to make your serum level below 5 to 6 milligrams. We are not doc, doctor, we are not God, we are not Shiva. So that is a thing which is to be kept in mind. And that's education is most, most, most important. But sir, it is yeah, said that... Sure. Uh... It is said, sir, that uh, uh, this uh, uh, high level of uric acid is not responsible for the acute flare-up. But it is the fluctuation of uric acid level in the serum which is responsible for the acute attack, for uh, uh, initiate this inflammatory action. So we should uh, uh, add this anti-inflammatory uh, drugs with the uh, um, this um, hypo uh, uric acid these drugs yeah uh, hypouricemic uh, just because of that uh, a sudden decrease in the level of uric acid can cause again a second attack of you are not playing here with the to decrease the levels of the uric acid or increase the levels of the uric acid. The main important motto was the patient's pain at that very moment. The acute flare has to be tapered with NSAIDs as well as steroids. To that, is that is and inflammatory. That is inflammatory. Why, why uh, this uh, problem occur is whenever there is an acute attack, as I already mentioned, the hypothalamic pituitary acid they release steroid and that is having a uricosuric effect. That is producing a decrease in the uric acid level. It is not anything blessing in that way. And as soon as that attack is over, it will start increasing. That's why I'm saying if your patient at that time of attack is having a high hyperuricemic level, hyperuricemia, then definitely you can start, as mentioned by Sir also, that nowadays we started at a gradual lower dose. Maybe if you're planning for aloperinol, 300 milligram, right now you can start with 100 milligram. If you're planning febrostate 80 milligram, right now you can start with 40 milligram. But Truly speaking, we have to assess where we are standing and, and confusion arises in those cases when attack is there, uric acid is normal. That is a dilemma. And at that time, the sepsis, septic arthritis is again a problem because if the counts are being raised, then you are in a mess. So every everything is a, they can't be thumb roll. That is why I mentioned in my last slide. Still, we required more, more research, more uh, systemic reviews, more analysis to come to more conclusion for these gray area conditions. Sir, suppose his patient is asymptomatic now. When to stop these xanthine oxidase inhibitors? So in that case, again, if asymptomatic, what is the history? If the patient is a diabetic, asymptomatic, the sugar should be controlled. If sugar is not controlled, never, never we are going to stop it. If the patient is rheumatoid arthritis, seronegative arthritis, arthritis is in flare up, we can't stop febrisostat. But if it is a condition of a idiopathic type, Sorry, if it is a condition of idiopathic type hereditary onset, we don't know the answer. But if it is a condition of some uh, some triggering factors with a alcohol, with a something like that, then definitely, yes, we need to gradually taper it down if that triggering factor has been removed. But most of the time, what I feel in my practice, 
I have patients in with the diabetic patient, uncontrolled diabetes, rheumatoid, where I require a hyperacemia to be controlled for months together till the rheumatoid arthritis is controlled, till the hypothyroidism is controlled, till the diabetes is con under control. No, sir. In idiopathic, how long? Idiopathic, uh, we can't say anything. It's fact the patient, we say always the patient to continue it. We don't know the answer. And in that case, I always make it 40 milligram twice a week. Ask them to go for, uh, you know, lifestyle modification. What are the culprit? Uh, what the culprit? Maybe diabetes or whatever it may be. Sorry, what are the culprit? And in that case, we are not able to stop it. As soon as we stop it, we again have a high, high rise in the hyperacemia. No, so so the, the initial teaching was you continued for lifelong. You know, now, now I have discussed with Professor Ja in one of the conferences also. Sir, how long? Sir, what is your view again? <laughs> I have told you about two recommendations. One was symptom-related or symptom relief, which was negated by NICE and said, don't always depend on symptom, go for the target. And for going for the target, it says follow-up. NICE says one year, I have formulated for our IORA that minimum three monthly follow-up, maybe even less, up to two years. And if there have been no relapses, then once yearly. So keep a watch on the reaching the target. It may be six months for a patient. It may be intermittent. Maybe th there could be a patient who in only two months reaches the target. So then you continue, you di uh, discontinue the treatment, but again have a watch. And again, maybe you have to start it. So no, sir, suppose time. patient becomes asymptomatic within two weeks time. And no, no, no. That I'm, level not talking is... of, I'm not talking of symptomatic. I'm talking target, of sir. reaching I'm the target. target. Yes, Tar patient is asymptomatic. Target is achieved within two weeks or four weeks. Should we stop the drug? No, sir. In that case, we still require a uh, maintenance dose, which yes. I always for, for, sir? Which is not been mentioned in the books. Which has not been mentioned in the book. Mentioned in the books. Practice, yes. I always give a maintenance dose for a month or so time in a very, uh, you know, 40 milligram twice a week, even once a week also, you know, which, which has not been mentioned. So that it has two advantages. One is controlling the level. The patient uh, desire to remove all those symptoms and the modification should always be a motivation factor, which if we give, giving it to the patient, it is always inspire a patient to also try from their end. So what, what I see is most of the patients, they stop the drug, you know, and they come with the second, third, fourth attacks. So what I follow is I continue them for six months at least, uh, you know, a monthly follow-up with a uric acid level. If the level remains below six for six months, I stop the drug. This is uh, what I follow. This is my are, protocol. I don't know. There are instances when it can go down to two or three, which Actually, again is not a very safe situation actually actually most of the time it happens like that that when it's settled down and that come to one even one milligram to the level and that is why this regular monitoring has been required every case is a different case but uh, as we mentioned by jhasar also we should keep a watch we should track the thing but every case is different case. what i what you are saying sir is that you always uh, give a patient a 40 milligram or aloprene or whatever 100 milligram so I am very much skeptical and doubtful about that because in that case, the uric acid will tremendously fall down to a very risky level. So we can't leave it as so, Sir, what I do is I, 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 I do monthly levels. Suppose I'm starting, you know, I, I, I'm giving the patient 80 milligram. So the level is coming down. I'll, I'll uh, put the patient on 40 milligram. Correct, sir. Correct, sir. That is it. Correct, so sir. suppose I say that it, it, the level is, you know, target is achieved, sir. Then I stop it at six months. This is I follow. I don't know. It is not again in the books, not in the books. Uh, one, one again, precaution has to be taken that today the patient goes to one lab. The next time goes to another lab is same not lab. a good practice. It same should lab. be same lab and a standard lab. And in fact, uh, very true, sir. In fact, uh, to add on, I always educate the patient. Don't come to me in your area. You pick up a lab, go every month there. I've educated you about the twice a week or once a week with your all precautions, check it every two months, see and decide your dose. I'm here to help you out. That is the right. best way to educate, educate and same educate. Lab. Same lab. Sir, third controversy point is regarding icing the pot. 
Now we say, you know, icing it precipitates the crystals and it increases the attacks. Now we are saying, you know, when there's acute attack, apply icing. So where we stand? I, I think your CPPD patients, they should be iced. And at a cooler temperature, as Dr. Sanjay Keskar was also saying, it precipitates. So it yes. is during the night time that it precipitates. And this is why early morning, very intelligent persons, they keep attacks of gout. So, yeah, true, very true, sir. And to add on for what I have said in my icing is, yes, true, but what we are giving icing is for, not for a, see, the, the crystals which have to be precipitated, they have precipitated. They have precipitated, they have produced inflammatory response. If the patient was treatment, if I'm giving a heat, I'm going to increase the flare-up situation. That is why on that other hand, go for a ice is a better option rather than to go for a heat or the best would be nothing to give but since we are getting here with the with the chapter so we have to cover what has been mentioned in the literature so they say icing is good but what i say icing is good is for that acute flare up that hotness which is there yes so in but, one of the literature in one of the literature just to add on to this just to add on in one of the literature, it was written that icing should be done for 24 to 48 hours till the acute flare has been settled with the steroid or NSAIDs you are giving. After right. that, you should stop icing. Correct. Because otherwise, you're going to yes. again precipitate the more. Precipitate the crystal, yeah. True, true. Dr. Amitabh, your question was soft tissue deposits. Dr. Amitabh, I think uh, he talked about, uh, he was saying about some soft tissue, you know, yeah, yeah. deposits. Soft, so soft, soft tissue. The same thing that uh, soft as tissue goes. Uh, uh, soft tissue gout. Um, run, uh, Kuldeep was saying, in my clinical practice, all the cases of periarthritis shoulder, which I see, I always go for a uric acid test. Most of the time, that is a culprit, which we feel it is a periarthritis shoulder. So, uh, hyperuricemia is very common entity with the shoulder also. And in that case, the crystals may be precipitated, the attack may be there, which can be worked up with a uh, USG examination. Then it's a different type of a cup of bold, which is to be done by a radiologist. So that is, a, and definitely, yes, as we mentioned by Professor Gupta, sir, also, that CPBD uh, uh, conditions are also there. So we can't differentiate that this patient with a shoulder problem, if it is not a classical periarthritis, is due to the hyperuricemia or due to a CPPD uh, involvement. Uh, and uh, even an ultrasonic examination can't go for it. And if the uric acid level is normal, then we can think over it for the CPPD. But on, for that case, we should be doubly, triply sure that this is not a classical periarthritis shoulder. Uh, sir, when, when to use uricosuric drugs indications? So uricosuric drugs, as we, we are discussing. No, I'm, I'm the... talking of, you know, you need some investigation before that, some urinary uric acid levels. Urinary uric acid level we don't require. No, we don't require. Simply by, oh. by blood uric acid level, we can work it up. All the, yeah. uh, uh, what I should say, nephrologists, they recommend come with 24 yes. hours yes. urine yes. collection <laughs> and estimation of uric acid in that 24 hour yes. sample. Yes. So, yes. sir, what is the reason for that? O only because they want to know uh, the extent of renal damage. There is some quantification if there is so much of uh, 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 urate crisis in the urine, I think the damage is this much. They quantify so that means, sir, ki whenever we damage. are managing such patient, we should, while managing, try to find out whether this patient is having a renal damage. And in that case, we should also, also request right. for a 24 hour urinary. So, uh, yeah. Renal function test is a must that is where, that we in follow-up and at initial stage as well. So, but I think okay. uh, the level has to do with it. Uh, when they are under excretors, or they say that when the level is less than 750 milligram percent, then we start with the uricosuric drugs. As far as my knowledge is, you know, 24 yes, hour urinary but, levels, 750 milligram percent. But when I was talking about the guidelines, I did say when your uh, genthin oxys oxidase inhibitors are not giving good response, you should combine, yes. combine. Yes. Not that you use them alone. Uh, sir, uh, uh, any other comments from any other panelists, please? Uh, sir, any, any other drawbacks? 
No, no. I is think a very general, up. very yeah. general kind of comment, which Rameshwar also said that a patient of gout can get swelling in the base of the big toe, but all the swelling in the base of the big toe is not gout. Not gout. Not gout. Yes. So this one very. victim has to be remembered. Sir, regarding very. icing, I want to uh, have Please. one comment, give one comment. Uh, my understanding as far as this cold fermentation or hot fermentation is concerned, as we all know that in all acute states, we prefer cold sponging or uh, icing. And all chronic uh, problems, we prefer hot fermentation. But since here, uh, most of the time, the patients are coming with acute and chronic. So what I prefer is this uh, contrast bath. That means initially icing and then after uh, six hours or seven hours, go for a little bit of hot fermentation also. So that is my this thing. So they are general yes, principles of yes, sir, yes. applying local heat. It, it right? has yes. been mentioned in the literature also, sir. That is true. But actually, truly speaking, practically, it's very difficult to manage to ask the patient with the, such a problem to go for such maneuvers. So that is why we rely more on the, it needed to be studied more. We rely more on steroid or the drugs. Right, right. right. At the same time. But very right. Possible. Sir, uh, last clarification, I think about the, you know, pulses and soya, they are high protein diets. So should we stop these drugs? Uh, the, these, the, these, should we ask the patient to stop these two things? Sir, all the pulses, it, uh, all the pulses yes, the soya are not like that. Soya is definitely, yes. In fact, uh, what I have read and found is the pulses, which are, you know, which is in Hindi called as sabut dale, jo hoti hai, that is having a very rich content of purine. But this arhar ki dal, which is a very common North Indian staple food, is not. Oh, both so, shilke wali, bagar shilke wali. Haan. Shilke so wali, that, bagar shilke wali. <laughs> that is the thing. So, so, patients are complaining actually, masoor, masoor ki dal and udad ki dal. Yes. Wo, mere cloud patients, sir, wo jab bhi bolte hai, sab mein udad ki dal kal khaya ta, aaj mera pain bada gaya. So, udad and that uh, masoor. Usually, I yeah. will avoid this. Dal, these, the... So, I think high protein uh, things should be avoided in general. Yes. As, as we say for drinks that have two units, similarly, we can say restrict it to limited amount and do not be very, very overusing. You should not be very harsh on telling them. Patients are so sensitive. मैंने yeah. इतने सालों से ये नहीं खाया मैं तो पहले कहता कि तू आज जा और वही वाला चीज पहन ले वाइन व्हाट अबाउट द वाइन सर इट विल बी रेड वाइन इज ओके यू एंड मी सर रेड वाइन इज ओके वील हैव अ वाइन वील हैव अ वाइन सो लेट अस वाइंड ऑफ दिस थिंग स्टॉप एयरिंग नाउ सो वी हैड अ वेरी नाइस डिस्कशन एंड थैंक यू ऑल द स्पीकर्स Thank you, all the panelists. Uh, thank you, Professor Jhasar, Professor Manish Khanna, Professor Rajesh Gupta, Professor Dilip Mojunda, sir, for being with us the whole time, Professor Sanjay Keskar, and uh, Dr. Kuldeep, and Dr. Rameshwar. He's always very tense. Rameshwar, I've seen him relax but today. he prepares <laughs> wonderfully good, well, Ramesh. I must say that. Yes, sir. No yes, pain, sir. no gain. No pain, no gain. So, no pain, no, no pain. No pain. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you uh, uh, Dr. Mukherjee, yes. Amita Mukherjee, our uh, president-elect. And, and uh, last comments from I, Dr. Dilip. And uh, yeah, very nice. And <laughs> nahi, nahi, abhi president elect ko bolna hai, bhai. Amitabh, president Amitabh, 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 Amitab
<laughs> he is doing that. It's a great endeavor, and we should continue. We will continue under guidance of Professor Jha and Manish Khanna and my dear friend Rajesh and Chinma and everyone. And we had a very dynamic secretary. With this, I can say Namaskar, sir. And learning has no ending. Every day, I had today learned so many things. So I think we will learn day by day. That's the only thing. And to end up again, I will say what Professor Jha has said. It is in my practice. Rajesh, you can remember Dr. Pachananda's day. Don't forget, Jai, I mean, Kolchisin. I still use 0 0.5 milligram. This is our boss, Dr. V.K. Pachananda. I think, sir, you can remember. Dr. Uh, he taught us in our house tough days. Don't forget this drug until, say, after this 36 or 37 years, I'm still using that. Yes. So, so uh, they, uh, uh, Ajumar, sir, you want to say something? Ah, oh, sir, sorry. Sir. Majumdar, sir, you want to say something? Yeah, Dilip actually, I, 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 have, I enjoyed everything because from beginning I was there, silently observing every speaker. Very nicely covered up. And Professor Jha has summed up in a package, a beautiful package. Uh, money stock, everybody stock. He has gone down and make a package like that. But I am interested about this uh, Rajesh when he is holding so that we can meet together there. I am actually interested about that. When he is holding, holding anything in uh, Srinagar or Jammu definitely, or wherever. Definitely. It is, it is on the cards, but uh, dates are the issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We will, <laughs> that yes, sir, we will have we will have a spine conclave and a hand conclave of rheumatoid. नहीं नहीं अभी सब लोग हम लोग लखनऊ में मिलने और जी के पास एक ऐसा preparation है जिसको लेने से gout नहीं होता है. I think doubtless वाले जो है वाइन सर इसको पब्लिक में डिक्लेयर ना कर दीजिए अदरवाइज आईफोन के स्टॉल की जगह यहाँ लाइन लगी होगी और कोई और कोई हम लोग के ऊपर केस तो सकता है और कोई फिर भी चीन में हमारे जिंदाबाद है I want to thank Dr. Neeraj and uh, Rishi, our uh, members from Ortho TV. They were continuously there. They were uh, there when the, they sent, I think individually, they sent the link to the faculties. So that's a good thing. I want to thank them. And Rishi is... Uh, are, Rishi, are you there now? Yes, sir. Actually, there are, yeah, there are so he was, he was there present all throughout the program. Is there any question in the box? No, no. No, sir. There is no question in the chat. Very box. nice. Thank you. Right, sir. So, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank, thank you very much, sir. much, sir. Thank you. Pranam, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank, thank, you thank you so much. Stop. Thank you so much. Bye, Manish. Thank you, sir. Thank oh. you. Fine, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you, sir.